any meaningful impact at all. The Ukrainians are you know, every when they put their airplanes up in the air, um, they tend to get shot down at a very high uh, rate. And I don't think that these aircraft, there's not enough of them to have a meaningful impact on the battlefield. All they're doing is providing more targets for the Russians. And uh, I believe that, unfortunately, for the Ukrainians, these aircraft and the pilots in them are going to have a very short life expectancy. Now, the United States is under pressure to provide the F-16 uh, fighter, which is, of course, an American fighter um, that, for some reason, people think are... Um, you know, some sort of miracle technology. The F-16, like the MiG-29, is old technology. And yes, there are upgraded versions of the F-16 uh, that could be provided, but we're probably not going to provide them because the Ukrainian pilots, again, um, are trained on the MiG. And anybody who, who, who's an athlete will understand what I'm about to say. Um, muscle memory, when you train to do something, it's muscle memory. You condition yourself to do the same thing over and over and over again, a repeatable exercise, so that it becomes second nature. Second nature to a football player, a basketball player, a baseball player doesn't have to think through what they're doing because they've tra practiced it, and it's second nature. This is the same thing with fighter pilots and military professionals. Whether you're an infantryman doing close quarter combat, you are trained, it's repetitive motion, so that when the world starts exploding, you do the same thing, you don't hesitate. The same thing with a pilot. You are trained in a specific airframe with specific avionics, with specific performance characteristics, and it's second nature for you. So a Ukrainian pilot who has extensive experience in a MiG fighter or a Sukhoi fighter, these Soviet era fighters, if you're gonna try and transition him to a F-16 fighter, it's a completely different airframe, completely different avionics, completely different system. And your muscle memory of the MiG is gonna interfere with your ability to properly absorb that this isn't me saying this. This is the experience of uh, a South Carolina Air National Guard unit that does this kind of transition training for former Soviet client states who have now become NATO members, Romania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, nations that had MiG fighters who are acquiring American fighters F-16s. There's a six month training program where you transition uh, you know, MiG pilots into F-16 pilots. And what the Air National Guard says is that if you have an experienced MiG pilot, he's actually a very bad F-16 pilot because of the muscle memory issues. He, when, when, when push comes to shove and he's put under stress, he falls back on that which he knows and is comfortable with, and he makes mistakes, he's slower. The pilots that do best are guys with little or no experience of flying a MiG, so they can be solely focused on flying the F-16. Um, and so this is a problem because, you know, the, the United States – you know, if we're going to provide the F-16, if the best Ukrainian pilots come over, we're actually going to make them worse. They're better off flying the Polish MiG-29s than they are flying American F-16s. The other thing is the F-16 is not capable of the kind of operations that the Ukrainians require. The F-16 has to fly from a an improved an improved airfield, a, an airfield that has you know good runway systems. Good logistical. It's a it's a very maintenance intensive aircraft. Um, the Ukrainians are flying from unimproved airfields. Now the MiG twenty nine can do that. It's designed to do that as a more robust, um, you know, uh, undercarriage, etc. The F sixteen can't. There's very few places in Ukraine that it could fly from. Those places are easily identified and targeted by the uh, the Russians. To provide the F sixteens to the Ukrainians would cost a lot of money, take a lot of effort, and there's that old saying. Uh, the, the squeeze ain't worth the juice. The, all the effort we're putting in, you're not going to get enough out of it. So the United States has made the right decision not to provide aircraft, which on paper would look like you're upgrading the performance of the Ukrainian Air Force, but in reality, you're degrading it. They're, they're better off getting aircraft that they are comfortable with, they know they can handle. The Ukrainians are never going to get enough aircraft to challenge the Russian Air Force in a one-on-one -on -one air supremacy battle. The best they're going to be able to do is have aircraft that can harass the Russians, that can harass their troops, that can carry out limited operations. And right now they're doing that with their existing, although severely diminished, Soviet-era air fleet. The MiG-29s, the Sukhoi-27s, uh, um, the, the Sukhoi-25s. These are the airframes that the Ukrainians need. They have pilots that can operate them. They have a system, logistic system, that can maintain them. And 
they are able to do the kind of operations that are realistic. To think you're going to come in with a number of American F-16 airframes and dramatically change the nature of this air battle is naive in the extreme. Okay. So on the one hand, the United States is smart in that they're thinking through this stuff. On the other hand, unless we're giving them a massive amount of uh, air support, it, it's just not going to change the, the trajectory of the war. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, yesterday, General Milley and Lloyd Austin of the Pentagon held a joint briefing. In there, uh, Lloyd Austin said something that was very confusing to me. And uh, well, yes and no. Okay. This, this is what he said. He said that Ukraine will be victorious because 50 nations are supporting her and Russia will not be victorious because only two nations, North Korea and, and Iran are supporting them. Are they really believing that this war is going to end depending on how many people are giving you or selling you weapons? I, that seems so naive to me. No, you're hundred percent correct. I mean, the fact of the matter is this war isn't just a military struggle on the battlefield. This war has an economic aspect to it and a geopolitical aspect to it, a diplomatic aspect to it. Uh, the, the, the majority of the world does not support what the United States is doing um, against Russia right now. Uh, the majority of the world is either neutral or leaning towards Russia. And that's important when we talk about the economic aspects. You see, one of the major um, pillars of the American policy approach towards Russia and this conflict with Ukraine was to sanction Russia, thereby undermining their economy, collapsing their economy, creating political pressure on the Russian president. Um, there are some people who have been honest about this. It's called regime change. We saw Kenneth Rogoff, the Harvard professor, member of the G30 banking uh, group, speak at the World Economic Forum in, uh, in, in January, I believe, or maybe even February, uh, where he said straight up, sanctions to, are, are designed for regime change. Uh, and we have the Canadian um, foreign minister who has come out and basically said the same thing, but we're, we're seeking regime change in Russia using sanctions. But if you talk to Angus King, the independent senator from the state of Maine, he just held a hearing. And Angus King is a big fan of sanctions. He's been promoting sanctions against Russia from day one. But he just held a hearing where he had to say it, it didn't work. It backfired. And he wants to know why that happened. Why were we promoting a policy that failed across the board, didn't succeed? Russia's economy is stronger now than it was when this war started. Uh, the Chinese economy has been reconfigured in a way to not only assist the Russian economic survival in this time of sanctions, but thrive. Um, India's uh, taking Russian energy and doing well on that. Uh, you know, the Russians have not been isolated. I, I don't mean to be facetious, but when was the last time a Russian bank failed? Um, and we, we can answer that question, when was the last time an American bank failed? So it's not the Russian economy that's having problems. Their economy was supposed to be contracting 25%. Uh, it contracted 2% uh, in 2022. And 2023 is expected to grow. And people should reflect on that. The Russian economy is going to grow despite the fact the United States and the entire collective West are sanctioning that economy. And it's a war economy. War economies don't grow. War economies go into deficit spending mode. The Russians are running a budget surplus which tells you they're doing something right. The sanctions have failed. So Lloyd Austin is completely wrong when he talk, when he starts throwing out numbers because the numbers are meaningless. Now we come to the military equipment aspect of it. Um, nothing Lloyd Austin talks about is going to change the equation that Jan Stoltenberg, the Secretary General, brought up uh, in January where he honestly said Ukraine is going to run out of 155 millimeter artillery ammunition in the summer and there's nothing that can be done to change that equation. There's no miracle cure. There's no magic wand. There's nothing that be, can be done. They're going to run out of ammunition. How does 50 nations equate into Ukraine running out of ammunition if it was functioning the way that Lloyd Austin is insinuating it is? The bottom line is, don't talk about the numbers of nations provided. Talk about the quality of the assistance. And the fact of the matter is that quality isn't enough. They're running out of ammunition. The United States has provided $115 billion worth of assistance to Ukraine, most of that in terms of financial assistance, but tens of billions of it in terms of military assistance. And yet the Pentagon has just put forward a budget 
uh, requirement down the road that says in order to replace the tens of billions of dollars of equipment that we provide to Ukrainians, the Pentagon needs $300 billion. That's a losing economic equation. I mean, I might be a simple Marine and I'm not an economist, but I don't believe that any equation that has you expending tens of billions of dollars and then requiring $300 billion to make up for that um, is has a trajectory that has you going in the right direction. And the United States isn't unique in this. Germany has pretty much acknowledged they've given away everything to Ukraine. They have nothing left. They have troops coming in. They have no helmets for these troops. They have no body armor for these troops. They have no guns for these troops. They have no ammunition for these troops because everything's been given away to Ukraine. And the Germans cannot afford to acquire the equipment necessary to replace it because prices have gone up. They can't build new tanks because the cost of steel is too high, and yet they're giving away the tanks to Ukraine, but not in enough numbers. It's like the MiG. You know, the tanks that are being provided uh, are, are insufficient quantity. I think the, the Spaniards right now are in the process of finalizing, uh, preparing uh, 10 tanks to be transferred to Ukraine. But six of those 10 tanks are in a depot uh, being brought back into service, meaning that they were broken. They were run down. They couldn't operate. So we're giving Ukraine broken tanks that are decades old. We can fix them, but they're going to break again. And Ukraine doesn't have the means to repair them. That's why the 50 is a, is a is is a meaningless number. When when they're putting that number out there, it, it has no uh, gravitas. It's not a serious number. The reality is, you know, the the actual quality and quantity of the equipment being provided to Ukraine, and it's insufficient to the test. The Russian defense industry, on the other hand. Is is cranking up, and here's the um, you know sort of the misleading thing. There's no evidence that North Korea is providing Russia with military assistance, none whatsoever. It's a it's an allegation that's put out by the United States, uh, basically for political purposes. But if you think about it logically speaking, this is an artillery driven war, and we've heard from the Jan Stoltenberg that Ukraine's going to run out of artillery. That's a that's a game changer. That's you know game ender there. When they run out of artillery, the war literally is over at that point in time. Russia uses a lot of artillery ammunition. Now, I'm somebody who believes in studying this problem that Russia's defense industry has been um, mobilized and they are producing an awful lot of artillery rounds. One of the numbers that has been put out there is, is around 420,000 rounds uh, per, per month. Um, that's a lot of artillery. They need that. That's the fuel for their war engine. Think about that. Think of the Russian artillery as the war engine. The, the shells are the fuel. So they need 420,000 rounds to, to keep this thing going. If that was an insufficient number and Russia is getting ready to launch a major offensive, that means they need more artillery. If they're going to acquire that from North Korea, that means the people who control Russia's fate are the North Koreans because that's the fuel. Imagine being a race car driver and coming into a pit stop and uh, not being in control of your fuel supply. And so you're pitting thinking, I'm gonna get fuel. Now, if your team has the fuel, you can be confident you're gonna have the fuel. But if you've delegated this to another team and you pull into a pit stop, but the other team doesn't provide the fuel, you lose the race. Russia will never delegate the fuel to its war engine to a third party, whether it be North Korea, whether it be China. Now on Iran, it's not that Russia has delegated anything. Russia has bought a specific weapon system from the Iranians, a drone system that helped Russia upgrade its own drone fleet. But while this has provided a qualitative uh, advantage for Russia in certain aspects of the conflict, it's not one that Russia has to have to win. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice to have, not a need to have. So the implication that somehow Iran is underwriting the Russian war effort just shows a level of ignorance about the sophistication um, of the of the Russian uh, defense industry and of the Russian military. And uh, I think it was irresponsible for both Lloyd Austin and Mark Miley to uh, to make such insinuations because it creates a false impression. And maybe maybe that's what they want. They just want the impression of the United States looking generous, but not having to actually fulfill kind of like Hey, we're going to give you 31 tanks, but we can't get them, you know, until 2024. You know, hey, at least at least they had good intentions and tried, right? So, um, okay, going going back to uh, Mark Milley, he said in that same conference that Russia, their military is making mindless moves with vast numbers of untrained soldiers. Uh, 
you know, there there could be some truth to that, but it, it does seem that Russia has become significantly more organized in the last 90 to 120 days. Is he using old intel or is is there some truth to what he's saying? No, there's no truth to what he's saying. It's not even that he's using old intel. What, what's happening right now, uh, and, and it's happening across the board, is what I call mirror imaging, meaning that Ukraine is right now in a in a state of imminent collapse. Uh, their military is becoming virtually dysfunctional. And one of the reasons is they're running out of manpower. So Ukraine is going around and literally kidnapping people off the streets, including 14 and 16 year old boys who are showing up on the front line with three days of training. So they're kidnapped from the streets of Odessa, given three days of training, they end up in Bakhmut and they die. This is happening in massive numbers. And this is a public relations problem for the Ukrainians. So what we're doing is we're mirror imaging the problems of Ukraine onto the Russians. But the Russians aren't doing that. The Russians mobilized 300,000 men in September. The vast majority of those men are still undergoing training. So the notion that these are poorly trained troops is this absurd in the extreme. These were military reservists who already had served in the military, had a modicum of, of experience. And instead of being thrown straight into the fight, they're being sent to a training area where for now, September, October, November, December, January, February, we're coming up on seven months of training uh, to get them ready to form on the battlefield. So, you know, Mark Milley is and, and just making this up. It's not what's happening. You, the, the Russians are extraordinarily well equipped. They have modern equipment, modern tanks, modern artillery. They have body armor. They have everything they need. And they're trained to do this job. These are not poorly trained troops. And they're not throwing them in human wave assaults. The fact of the matter is uh, that the, the, the casualty ratio right now is is insane. Um, you know, normally in, in, a, in a war, uh, the, uh, the offense versus defense is uh, you want a three to one advantage from the offense to defense because generally speaking, you're going to take more casualties than a defender. So you need that kind of uh, advantage. The Russians right now are, you know, operating with parity in numbers when it comes to infantry, but superiority in numbers when artillery, but on the casualty ratio, they're killing Ukrainians sometimes as high as 16 to one in a day. Uh, sometimes it drops down to 10, sometimes it drops down to eight. But that what that means is if you on a on the best day the Ukrainians are having, for every 800 Ukrainians that die, they're killing 100 Russians. But on the worst day, for every 100 Russians that die, 1,600 Ukrainians die. And the Ukrainians are having a lot of bad days, not so many good days. But even their good day is a nightmare. It's Ukraine that's chewing through its troops uh, at a rate that's unimaginable. And I think it was Lloyd Austin that threw out a number. Um, you know, casually a number of 100,000, I think in the same presentation, he talked about 100,000 uh, dead. But he knows that's a lie. He knows that he was reported to by General Zaluzny, uh, uh, Zaluzny of, the, of the Ukrainian army uh, last month that Ukraine had suffered uh, close to 250,000 dead, on top of which there are 83,000 missing, most of whom are dead, which means that Ukraine has suffered around 320,000 dead. That's the honest number. But Lloyd Austin can't be honest about that because that's a number that just boggles the mind. If you look at the combatant losses of the United States in World War II in both the Pacific Front and the and the European Front, we didn't lose 320,000 dead. We lost fewer than that in terms of combatant deaths, people who die in combat. The Ukrainians have lost 320,000 combatant deaths in one year. That's a ridiculous number. That's a sickening number. Um, and it reflects the reality of what's going on on the ground in Ukraine today. And Lloyd Austin and Mark Milley can't be honest about that, because if they were, American people would say, then we need to bring this war to an end, because this is just resulting in the death of people that we claim to be supporting. Yeah, I spoke uh, recently with Colonel McGregor, and he said that the United States, this is a humanitarian crisis now, and that they they owe it to Eastern Europe to switch gears and sue for peace um, and and withhold uh, weapons and support until they seek peace. But for some reason, they continue to defer to Zelensky to decide when is there peace? When is this over? What does winning and losing look like? How much money and weapons do you do you need? Why is the United States continuing to give Zelensky so much authority 
over this war when it's obvious that it's the United States and, and the United Kingdom and Germany and Poland driving the majority of uh, the rhetoric and the equipment into the war? That's a very good question. To, to answer that, we have to understand the quality of the advice being given to the president of the United States. You know, right off the bat, when you have senior people admitting that the policy was regime change, that we wanted to put in sanctions and create political pressures to bring down Vladimir Putin, it tells you two things. One, there is a very strong anti-Putin animus existent in the U.S. government. And two, there's a level of ignorance about Russia that is mind boggling. Um, I'm not going to brag, but you know, back in December, I predicted, I said, if we implement these sanctions, Russia will emerge stronger, intact, and it will be the Western economies that begin to collapse. I was proven 100% correct. Why? Because I have taken the time to study Russia, understand Russia, and understand the realities of their economy. But to do that, I have to cut through the fiction that's been uh, put up there about, for instance, that Russia is a nation ruled by one man, Vladimir Putin, the all-seeing, all-knowing, all-evil dictator who, who controls everything. Instead of recognizing the reality that Russia is a very large country where control has been delegated to regional uh, authorities who manage their individual regions, who come together using a bureaucracy to create a consolidated, um, you know, unified a policy that's then taken up to Putin, who oversees it, you know, as a manager, as the chief executive, but not as a dictator. Uh, if you understand what I say is the reality, then you're able then to take the time to read the position papers that are put out there. The Russians are telling us what they're what they're doing. They don't lie. They are a very transparent society. Their budget is published. The documents that are used to create that budget are published, and. Um, People need to take the time to read that. But if you do that, then it takes away your ability to say, well, Vladimir Putin is the personification of evil. Because if you take the time to study Russia and learn Russia, you realize he's just a very effective manager of, uh, of a very complex and expansive um, you know, nation. Joe Biden is surrounded by what I call the, the, Russia, the Putin whisperers. This is a, a group of people who came into academic uh, maturity uh, at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the decade of the 1990s, when the goal of the United States was to keep Russia down, to weaken it economically, control it politically, and if necessary, to break it up um, into constituent parts that would forever keep it weak and never able to rise up and, um, and challenge the United States in the way that the Soviet Union had done during the Cold War. Um, these are people like Michael McFaul, Fiona Hill, Angela Stent, um, and others who you know, have written their PhD thesis on uh, authoritarian rule and Vladimir Putin. These are people who supported Boris Yeltsin's government and are resentful that Putin emerged from the post-Yeltsin period to try and unify Russia and make Russia strong again, which he has done. Whether you like Putin or you dislike Putin, you have to acknowledge that he has taken Russia out of, you know, the swamp that Boris Yeltsin had, uh, had had created in the post-Gorbachev, post-Perestroika era. And he has taken Russia up to be one of the most strong, the strongest and most resilient economies. People talk about infrastructure. In the United States, of course, we, we have concerns about infrastructure. We have rail cars derailing. We have bridges collapsing, et cetera. People don't like to talk about the fact that Vladimir Putin has just succeeded in, in, in uh, expanding the Russian subway around Moscow. And if you go on the subway, will put anything New York City has to shame instantly. The totality of the Russian subway, it's modern, it's clean, it's efficient, it's everything we would want our infrastructure to be, and everything we claim the Russian infrastructure can't be, because if he's a dictator ruling over this dysfunctional country, how could they possibly produce that? But the Russians produce a lot of good things. It's a nation that's on, on the rise. Um, and I'm not saying that because I want to sing its praises, I'm saying it because that's real. That's You can't solve a problem unless you first accurately define the problem, because any solution you come up to a problem that's not accurately defined isn't a solution at all. It's nothing. To discuss Russia as a problem, we have to describe it accurately, and it can't be described accurately if you're putting everything on the shoulders of Vladimir Putin and you're trying to describe him as this evil uh, character, which, of course, all senior Americans doing, whether they're in the Pentagon or they're in the White House or they're in Congress, 
you will not see a single person say what I just said about the reality of Russia. Instead, Congress holds hearing after hearing where they bring in these Putin whisperers who say over and over again about how bad Russia is, how poorly it performs, how dysfunctional it is, and how dictatorial Vladimir Putin is. That's just not the truth. Yeah. Okay, speaking of uh, Putin and politicians, uh, yesterday, Senator Lindsey Graham called for the U.S. military to start shooting down Russian warplanes anytime they enter international waters. Um, this is his reaction to uh, the Russia, Russia, Russian fighter jet taking down the, uh, the Reaper drone over the Black Sea. What kind of repercussions would there be for the United States if we start shooting down Russian warplanes? Well, the potential for all-out war. I mean, Russia is not going to let that happen. They would challenge us militarily, and then we would end up in a force-on-force -force conflict um, that neither side can afford to back down from. So it turns into total war, and then uh, that has the potential of turning into a nuclear exchange, and then this conversation is moot because we're going to be dead. Um that's what Lindsey Graham needs to you know, understand. And that's what the people who listen to Lindsey Graham need to understand. He's a very dangerous man right now. I know he's a United States senator. I know he's allowed to speak his mind and, um, you know, et, et cetera. But that doesn't mean the people who are listening to him should treat what he's saying uh, as if it is the truth. Um, he is speaking in a very dangerous manner. First of all, he said that uh, Ronald, you know, he implied that Ronald Reagan would never allow something like this to happen. Well, with all due respect, Lindsey Graham, I was in the military uh, as a Soviet expert during the Reagan administration, and we let it happen all the time because, you know, the the, the idea of uh, flying provocative uh, mission profiles with aircraft or with ships uh, didn't begin today. And people should be under no you know, misconception here. What we did with the Reaper was a provocation. We took an intelligence collection platform, flew it. In, a, in an area that the Russians know, that we know is very sensitive to Russia, right off the coast of the Crimea Peninsula, one of the most heavily militarized areas in Russia, during a time of war when the United States has a history of collecting intelligence, giving it to Ukrainians so they can target the Russians. So the fact that we're flying an intelligence collection profile in support of Ukraine along uh, the Russian coast is in itself an act of war. This isn't a peaceful exercise. We are being provocative, deliberately so. Two, the Russians have created an exclusion zone and have announced that to the United States, saying that you cannot fly in this area because we have sensitive military activity taking place. That is required under international law. But what we're saying is that because Crimea is Ukrainian, not Russian, the Russians illegally occupied it, Russia has no ability to put an exclusion zone in on what is Ukrainian territory, so we disregarded it. So we sent a $32 million aircraft into this exclusion zone with a sensitive intelligence collection pod, collecting intelligence that when it's returned will be given to the Ukrainians to plan military operations against the Russians. And we're shocked that the Russians put the plane down. Uh, so Lindsey Graham is wrong. Marco Rubio, who also came out and spoke about this, is wrong. This wasn't the United States innocently trying to exercise freedom of navigation. This was the United States uh, carrying out a purposefully uh, provocative uh, military operation that makes the United States an active participant in an ongoing conflict. And so if you see it in that perspective, you realize what we did was horribly irresponsible. And now Lindsey Graham is talking about escalation by bringing in, you know, manned fighter aircraft uh, in a way that's designed to create a force on force incident with uh, the United States and Russia. Um, this is bad policy. Fortunately, I don't see the Pentagon or the White House going down this path because there are saner minds out there than Lindsey Graham or Marco Rubio. Okay. So they're going to be ignored. <laughs> okay. That's good. Okay. Uh, this, this has been really great in our last couple minutes together on our last meeting, you talked about being a part of a team that put together a treaty that literally saved the world from, I believe, nuclear war. Uh, I, I would like to hear about that. Sure. Um, I, I just wrote a book about it, Disarming the Time of Perestroika, um, Arms Control and the End of the Soviet Union. It's about the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty or the INF Treaty. Um, intermediate nuclear forces are uh, ballistic missiles or cruise missiles with a range between uh, 500 and 5,000 kilometers. Um, these were systems that um, were, were 
seemed uh, deemed to be extremely destabilizing in the European environment. The United States deploying Pershing II missiles, for instance, into West Germany, gave us the ability to strike Moscow seven minutes after launch, which means the Russians had no warning time if this was launched. So Russia would push the button and fire everything. And that time, everything included SS-20 road mobile missiles, very difficult to target, each of which had three nuclear warheads aimed at European cities. So this, this was the scenario with these weapons in place. The Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty made the decision to get rid of these weapons, a very bold decision. It was a decision made by Ronald Reagan, who is one of the most conservative presidents we've ever had, a man who called the Soviet Union the evil empire, a man who once joked about launching missiles against the Soviet Union, uh, and Mikhail Gorbachev, a reformist who took the Soviet Union away from the, um, the policies of the past, tried to lead them down a new road through, the, through what we called the reforming, the perestroika restructuring of, uh, of the Soviet Union. They came together in December of 1987 and signed this treaty. What made this treaty unique isn't just the fact that we were getting rid of perhaps the most dangerous weapons in the world, but how we were doing it. Prior to this, we had other arms control agreements, but we never had the ability to do uh, serious compliance verification. You know, uh, so, and that controlled the kind of treaty we could get into. You have to have confidence that the other side isn't going to cheat. But if you're not allowed to allow, uh, allow humans on your soil, for instance, the Russians would never allow Americans on their soil, and we would never allow Russians on their soil because we just trust one another. So the level of confidence in compliance is very low. So you don't want to make a treaty that um, assumes good things are going to happen. Trust, but verify. That was Ronald Reagan's mantra for the INF Treaty. And the key to verification was people like me who became inspectors. Uh, and we were the first, it was the first time in the history of arms control that on-site inspections took place where teams traveled to the Soviet Union, Soviet teams traveled to the United States and personally oversaw the implementation of this treaty. My, uh, my role was unique in that um, I was involved in what they called perimeter portal monitoring. Um, the Soviets had a factory in Vodkinsk, which is a city about 750 kilometers due east of Moscow in the foothills of the Ural Mountains, that used to produce the SS-20 missile that I talked about with the three warheads. Well, that missile is supposed to be destroyed. Um, but then the Soviets said, well, the factory also produces the SS-25 missile, which is an intercontinental range missile, which is permitted. But the first stage is the exact first stage that was on the SS-20. So now we have to monitor production to make sure that the Soviets aren't using SS-25 production to create a covert production line of SS-20s. And that's where I came in. We built a facility to monitor production out there using giant X-ray machines, uh, visual inspections, the whole works. This was a unique experience. I mean, it was unprecedented in the history of arms control. Um, and the, the, we succeeded despite all of the obstacles. I mean, this is a part of history that not too many Americans are familiar with. Uh, but it was one of the most amazing experiences you can imagine because we literally, despite all the obstacles, the, the, the history of prejudice between the United States and the Soviet Union, um, we broke through that to create a cooperative working environment. with And think about that, ladies and gentlemen. Today, people say, how could Russia ever and the United States ever again work together? In the 1980s, our, the relations were just as bad as they are now. Some people would say worse. And we found mm -hmm. a way engaging in arms control, working in a cooperative fashion to eliminate these missiles and make the world a better place to live. We could do it again. So this experience of the INF Treaty is not just history, changers in local politics, given the fact that they, um, you know, they imply jobs, um, you know, with the good tax base, uh, et cetera. The American dream, people who have these jobs can, of course, buy their house with the two garages and, and all this sort of thing, at least for the moment. Um, so when, whenever someone says, well, wait a minute, we need to rein in defense spending, you can't because the economy, the way it's constructed, depends on this money. If you cut defense spending, you're cutting jobs, you're cutting factories, you're cutting the tax base. Uh, so they're so closely intertwined, um, you know, as, as to be one and the same. Um, and so, you know, yes, the defense industry plays a, a heavy role on uh, continuing defense spending at the levels they are and increasing them. And normally you can't justify this kind of defense spending unless you have a posture 
on how you interact with the rest of the world that justifies this level of expenditure, which is why the national security strategy document is so critical, because that defines how America is going to interface with the world going forward. And given the fact that it's linked to this defense budget, it means our interfacing will be a very aggressive uh, with a high probability of military conflict. And let's, let's get to the Ukraine war. What, why the Ukrainian decided to bomb Poland? Why, what, what, what was their ultimate goal? Well, Poland. we won't know until we actually, um, until somebody takes into custody the people who made that decision. I personally believe that the decision was made at a lower level uh, by a, an ultra-nationalist uh, who fired a Ukrainian surface air missile into Polish territory for the express purpose of creating a crisis, and they got what they wanted. Everybody is focused on the initial, um, you know, outcries from Poland and the Baltic states and the Czech Republic, um, blaming it on Russia and asking for an Article Four, um, you know, conv uh, to convene Article Four uh, discussions on possibly creating a no-fly zone. Um, there was no Article 4 discussion. The adults in NATO said, no, we know what happened here. Um, and there won't be a no-fly zone now. But look what they got. Look what they accomplished. Germany is deploying two Patriot surface-to-air missile batteries to the Ukrainian border. Previously, uh, NATO didn't want to put uh, air defense units that far forward because the air defense umbrella would extend into um, Ukrainian territory. Um, and that could lead to the potential of force-on-force -force conflict. But now they're doing it. Why? Because Ukraine attacked Poland, not Russia. Ukraine attacked Poland, and Germany's responding in a way as if Russia attacked Poland by extending NATO air defense into western Ukraine. Germany's also bringing fighter aircraft to fly combat air patrols over Polish territory. Again, not because Russia threatened Poland, but because Ukraine attacked Poland. They are positioning the pieces necessary for a very rapid um, implementation of a no-fly zone over western Ukraine. And ask yourself why this is happening and why would Ukrainian nationalists do this. Um, that you, you, we have to understand the reality is Ukraine is losing this war and will lose this war. Everybody knows this. Um, they, the politicians want to pretend otherwise, but anybody with any military common sense understands that the military math, is, uh, the, 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 the algorithm is such that Ukraine cannot win this conflict. They are burning through their resources, a burn rate much higher than their replenishment rate. Meanwhile, Russia is about to receive 10 to 15 division equivalents of troops next month, trained, equipped, ready to fight. Um, and that's a game-changing event. And uh, it'll begin a process of degradation of Ukrainian um, military capability up to and including the destruction of the Ukrainian armed forces. So the only way to stop this, because there's not enough money to stop this, there's not enough time, there's not enough equipment, there's not enough manpower, uh, is to, from Ukraine's perspective, you have to have NATO intervene. And so they put them in pieces, um, the, the, a, a system that could lead to the establishment of a no-fly zone, and now the big problem is what happens when millions of Ukrainian refugees show up on the border of Poland demanding entry because they're freezing to death, because they're hungry, because they have no power, they have no gas, they have no hope. Um, Poland isn't going to let them in. Europe can't absorb them. Europe has its own economic problems. So there will be a growing demand for uh, the creation of a humanitarian corridor where the Western powers can go into Ukraine and provide the shelter, the food, the medical care for these refugees, but those refugees will insist that they need to be protected from a Russian threat. So then they'll implement a no-fly zone. That's the direction we're heading. And it's a very dangerous situation because I don't know how Russia would respond to that. Does Poland have air defense system or no? Yes, or they do. What, what it didn't work? Well, first of all, um, air defense isn't perfect, um, meaning you don't always shoot down what you're looking at. Second of all, um, their air defense has suffered, uh, like the rest of NATO, from um, a lack of attention. Um, you know, just because Russia 
you know, moved into Ukraine in February doesn't mean that Poland solves all of its problems ever since. Poland has put a lot of its money into uh, its ground forces, uh, supplying uh, material to Ukraine, and they haven't paid as much attention to air defense as necessary. They don't have modern air defenses. That's just why Germany is being called upon to deploy the Patriot missile to the uh, Ukrainian border. And Scott, we, we, we have the, the Sunak of Britain and Trudeau calling Zelensky after killing two Poles and calling him as a friend and, 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 and how, how hypocrisy can get thick and thicker in this, in this battle, in this war. They, 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 were, they, were, they, were, they were they were talking about the barbarity of Russians while Ukrainian bombed Poland and killed two, two, two people. How, I don't understand this. No, I mean, what, what is there to understand? We have politicians living in a fantasy world. Um, you know, the bottom line is, um, though, that all military professionals understand what's about to happen in Ukraine. And um, politicians' job is to help Ukraine um, navigate their own domestic political obstacles um, toward a, a negotiated settlement. But the, you know, Ukraine has put unrealistic terms out there. Uh, you know, Putin has to leave. That ain't going to happen. Um, the Russians have to evacuate the four territories that are now part of Russia. That's not going to happen. Russia has to give up Crimea. That's not going to happen either. And Russia has to turn over. Um, well, Russia has to pay reparations. Don't think so. And Russia has to turn over its military and civilian leadership to Ukraine to be prosecuted as war criminals. I mean, this is just fantasy. Fantasy. And Russia is not even going to play this game. Russia, I believe, you'll see starting next month, is going to initiate actions that will lead to the termination of this conflict on terms that will be dictated by Russia and nobody else. And we know that 40,000 troops, American troops in Poland, what they're doing there, are they tra training the, the, the soldiers? I don't know they're, they're, what, what they're doing there. Well, they're there is um, a, a deterrence against, I mean, they're there to deter a Russian invasion of Poland, but Russia has no intention of invading Poland. Um, and, but they're there to uh, make a presence, to make the Polish feel like they're being defended and protected. Um, they're, not, they're not a serious combat force. Uh, anybody who thinks that these 40,000 would be useful in a war against Russia doesn't understand what war is and what's needed to fight a war, and et cetera. There's no sustainability factor there. There's no real combat power there. Um, it's literally a political force. It's a, a force of deterrence, a tripwire. Um, against an event that will never happen. Russia will not be invading Poland. Can Russian, can Russian block the lines of providing weapons to Ukraine? If so, what they're not doing this? Um, first of all, it's a huge border. So, you know, it's a, it's a difficult target to begin with. Um, second of all, to do so would require the uh, a level of destruction that uh, Russia has said it didn't want to engage in, um, you know, permanent uh, disabling of Ukrainian civilian infrastructure. Um, third, it would require an escalation of violence near the uh, near the border of the border of NATO countries, increasing the likelihood of spillover, uh, which Russia doesn't want. Um, you know, Russia has made a hard decision that. They're better off interdicting and destroying this equipment once it reaches the battlefield than trying to get it at the border. Um, and so far, Russia, yes, they've, they've paid a price. Yes, there are systems in play, but uh, Russia's winning this conflict. So from a strategic standpoint, the Russian decision is a proper decision. Uh, Russia must ensure that it does not do anything that gives NATO an excuse to intervene. And interdicting um, arm shipments at the border uh, could create the conditions where NATO was compelled to intervene. So Russia's giving them the border and seeking to interdict this material once it comes across. 
Uh, but, you know, the United States has deployed a lot of resources that are um, committed to getting the stuff from the border to the Ukrainian armed forces. And some of um, the best and the brightest in the American military establishment are involved in coming up with ways to avoid Russian interdiction. So it's a it's a um, it, it's a it's a deadly game of cat and mouse taking place. Sometimes the Russians are able to bomb a warehouse. Sometimes they're not. But once the stuff comes to the battlefield, Russia destroys it. And we have the Spiegel from Germany reported that high-tech German art artillery guns are failing. Just yesterday, it came out that they're failing, and Germany cannot afford cannot afford to to enough spare parts to keep the cannons working. How 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 ridiculous is that? If Germany is like <laughs> this, how how they gonna fight anything? Well, understand that Germany has, um, when it absorbs a weapon system, it has a system that's designed to maintain the equipment uh, and operate it uh, within the German system. Uh, the problem is they've sent this advanced equipment over to Ukraine where there's insufficient maintenance. And I think what Germany's saying is that if they give the spare parts to Ukraine, they won't have any spare parts for their guns if they go to war. So... And this is the same thing with the American M777, you know, the, it has a high failure rate, uh, it, especially if it's operated with the level of intensity that the Ukrainians are using their artillery. Um, you know, it's going to fail and there are insufficient spare parts. You don't provide the Ukrainians with advanced Western um, equipment. It's not, it's not a smart move. It's a self-destructive move. It, it looks good politically. It plays well initially on the battlefield, but in the long term, um, the old Soviet era artillery pieces are what you want because they work all the time, every time. You can have them rusty, you can cover them in mud, you can kick them, you can drop them, uh, you can do anything you want with them, and yet when you pull the lanyard, they fire. Um, not so the, the Caesar, the French artillery, or the German artillery, or the American artillery. These are high-tech, complicated pieces of equipment that really didn't factor in the reality of continuous large-scale ground combat in Europe when they were designed. And we had Lloyd Austin on Saturday he, at, at the Halifax International Security Forum. He made a, a pretty amazing statement. In, his, in this statement, he's, in, in the first part, he says that Russians have a massive military and impressive weapons, which debunks all the, all the analysis by Petraeus since the war started. And all along the war, it debunks all, all of the analysis of Petraeus. How, how do you see this statement? From well, remember, Petraeus is no longer on active service. Petraeus' job right now is to appease his masters, and his masters are corporate media. Um, so his job is to create perception amongst the American public uh, to the extent that he has connectivity with uh, establishment it's only to release information that's been cleared by the establishment to be released to the american people through the vehicle of david petraeus to provide more credibility but there's nothing credible about anything david petraeus says about ukraine he's been wrong across the board um in lloyd austin's uh initial statement in uh in, in halifax uh underscores that that uh the reality is people who know what's going on understand that russia has tremendous military capability and in, in, in the latter part of his, his statements, he says that considering all those weapons, Russian couldn't prevail. How, how do you see this, this, this part of his statement? Well, his job is to support the Biden administration's policy. So he cannot be seen as saying anything that undermines that policy. One would think that his job would be to provide accurate uh, information to the president about military affairs, but that's not his job. That's the job of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, who recently said, we need to be looking for a negotiated off-ramp here because Mark Milley knows that we can't win, that the West can't win. But Lloyd Austin can't say that. He's a political appointee. He's not an elected official. It's not his career job, even though he came from a career military background. His job is to sustain the policies of the Biden administration 
uh, and remember the Biden administration is getting ready to ask a lame duck Congress session, a lame, lame duck session of Congress for around $40 billion more assistance to Ukraine. So if Lloyd Austin got up and said, and we can't win, um, that means why are we sending more money? Lloyd Austin has to say something that justifies the uh, amount of weaponry that the United States is, uh, is, is preparing to send to Ukraine. And the other day he had a he had a an interview with with CNN. He said that he, the, 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 the reporter asked him, how, how do you see Shoigu? Are you talking to him? Are you, oh, what, what, how, 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 how you, you're communicating? He said, I know that Shoigu, is, he, he, he's not the one who decides about everything. He, he, just, he just gets the order. And I was thinking, like, what are you doing, Lloyd Austin? <laughs> yeah, well, well, let's, <laughs> let's remember this. Um, Lloyd Austin has been Secretary of Defense for two years. Um, Shoigu has been Putin's close personal friend for 22 years. Now, you tell me, who do you think has more influence on whom? Do you think Shoigu, a close personal friend of Vladimir Putin, who has been with him from the very beginning of his presidency, was instrumental in helping Putin uh, not just become president, but remain as president? And Lloyd Austin, this fly-by-night nobody, uh, picked out for political reasons, um, who doesn't have a close personal relationship with Biden, and in any case, in two years, will be history. Um, you tell me who is more influential. It ain't Lloyd Austin. Okay, Lloyd Austin lives in an American bubble of fantasy, where he believes he's important, he believes he's doing this. At the end of the day, you know, Biden will do what Biden does because Biden didn't need Lloyd Austin when to, to, for Biden to be where he is today. Vladimir Putin understands that, you know, the role that Shoigu has played over the years in supporting him. Shoigu is loyal. Shoigu um, can be trusted. And so when a trusted, loyal um, friend slash servant, because remember, they go on vacations with each other. When was the last time Joe Biden went on vacation with Lloyd Austin? When was the last time they went fishing, you know, together, um, you know, camping, et cetera? No. Uh, so Austin lives in a fantasy world. It, he, he, he's impressed with his own importance. Um, and he is being dismissive of something he doesn't understand. He doesn't know Shoigu. Just because you had a phone conversation with Shoigu doesn't mean you know Shoigu. I'm not saying Shoigu is perfect. Of course, he's made mistakes just like everybody else. I'm saying that the relationship between Shoigu and Putin is such that Putin will listen to Shoigu every time he picks up the phone. Whereas the relationship between Austin and Biden is such that Austin may not call the, the president because he's concerned that the phone won't be answered. How, how serious is the situation of energy in Ukraine? We know that they cannot provide civilians with, with energy. How they can keep, keep the war going? Well, the, the, the war can be fought because troops are able to dig in, build a bunker, build a small fire, stay warm. Um, civilians, on the other hand, in an apartment building that has no heat or energy or light are just freeze to death. Um, and this is, this is problematic for Ukraine. Um, this is a huge crisis. Um, and I think when you combine the reality that Ukrainians are in a untenable situation, in terms of energy, that a significant percentage of their of their civilian population is going to be put at risk, to include risk of death because of the situation, uh, and you combine that with Russia's impending reinforcement by 220,000 troops, um, it all just adds up to a situation where Ukraine will not be able to continue to fight this war. And. How we know that yesterday Ukrainian again are shelling Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. 
how, how I don't know I, I, I don't know why why the, the, the Western allies of Ukraine are not telling them what they, they, they have to, there has to be some limits to their actions. Well, uh, it's just the opposite. The Western allies are telling the Ukrainians to shell it, keep shelling it, don't stop shelling it, create this sense of emergency so that the International Atomic Energy Agency can negotiate the, the demilitarization of the plant and taking over the plant, taking it out of Russian control and turning it over to Ukrainian control. Uh, that's the goal right now. Um, so the West will never condemn this. The West will always support it. They'll, they'll, they're, they're implicitly telling the Ukrainians to keep shelling it because, because they're not telling the Ukrainians to stop. So t you know, by t not telling the Ukrainians to stop, you're basically saying, keep on doing it. Meanwhile, they're pressing the IAEA to go forward and uh, make the case for the internationalization of the uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant with an eye uh, to once that occurs to turn it over to Ukrainian government control. And the Financial Times reported that there are rumors that there are, I don't know if there are tensions between the top military commander of Ukraine and between between him and Zelensky. How is there a gap started to, to, to develop in, in between them? Well, there's always been a gap. Um, the, the military is not happy with Zelensky, and Zelensky is not happy with the military. Uh, the military knows the reality is they cannot continue this fight without the tens of billions of dollars of assistance provided by NATO and the United States and others, uh, and that the person that's responsible for getting this assistance is Zelensky. Zelensky has been turned into this propaganda machine. He's the new Winston Churchill, King Leonidas, etc., and so the military has to tolerate Zelensky, and Zelensky therefore has leveraged the influence he has over the West into the ability to dictate courses of action to the military, insisting that the military conduct offenses that serve very little military purpose but have political value that Zelensky believes he needs to go to the West for more money. Um, but now we've reached a situation where there isn't enough money in the world to save Ukraine. Uh, so Zelensky's value is diminishing, and you see that. He, he, his lies to the West about the missile. Um, people are already um, you know, saying he's... He knew he's, that? He knew that? It doesn't matter what he knew. It matters what he said. He's the commander-in-chief. He's the president. You don't open your mouth until you know all the facts. You don't commit to a narrative uh, until you know all the facts. He committed to a narrative that's wrong, and he's doubled down and he's embarrassed himself, and the military is embarrassed for him. Um, the, you, you see in the, in the West, the, um, the, the general has um, a high profile now. Everybody's talking about him, about how good of a general he is, a good military commander, he's a good leader, and Zelensky um, is being called a fool, a buffoon, or he will just stop talking about him. So the, the general star is rising, Zelensky stars dimming. Uh, we have ex-Japanese Prime Minister saying that Zelensky is making Ukrainians suffer. I, I wonder why why he's doing that, this to Ukraine and Ukrainians. It, it seems that he's ready to, to, to risk the entire world in this war. Well, remember, he is a comedian who was put in power by an oligarch to do the bidding of the oligarch and had found himself leading a nation at war and he's totally unqualified to do so. He is a product not of his resume and his, his uh, accomplishments. He's a product of a script that has been written for him by others. Um, so if you're saying that Zelensky is, you know, once the you know his country to be destroyed no Zelensky simply doing that which other nations have told him to do under the notion that Ukraine can somehow be saved um, but Ukraine can't be saved because nobody was ever interested in saving Ukraine they were only interested in harming Russia 
And so the West was willing to sacrifice everything to achieve the objective of harming Russia. And because Zelensky was a compliant tool of the West, his policies have ultimately end up doing extraordinary harm to Ukraine. And how do you see the midterm elections in the United States? The other day I was ta I was talking to I was talking to Professor Jeffrey Sachs. He was hoping it was before the election. He was hoping that this change, uh, if Republicans win wins, uh, at that time he was talking about this. If Republicans win, we 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 can we may see the change in the U.S. policy. How do you see this? He's gonna oh Pelosi. We know that Nancy Pelosi is stepping down. But is it going to change the U.S. policy on Ukraine? Um, ultimately, probably not in terms of the policy, which is to back Ukraine, oppose Russia, etc. But the amount of money that's provided Ukraine may, in fact, change, um, especially if people like Nan um, Margaret uh, Taylor Greene um, are able to ask questions and demand answers of the military that the current Democrats were un unwilling to do so. Um, you know, when it becomes clear that we've provided Ukraine with tens of billions of dollars that nobody can account for, we don't know where it went, we don't know how it was used, we don't know if it was used to support terrorists in, in Europe, etc. Um, that creates a political momentum of its own. Uh, and, and there's no telling what that will lead to. Um, whether a, uh, the appointment of an inspector general because Americans want to continue to supply Ukraine with tens of billions of dollars, but this time they want it to be accounted for, accounted for or um, the reduction of aid uh, until which time Ukraine can you know, tell us how it was used or a withdrawal from Ukraine. We don't know what, what the spinoff is. Initially, the Republicans appear to be inclined to continue to support uh, a war against Russia because the Republicans are as deeply infected with, with the Russophobic disease as their Democratic counterparts are. They hate Russia. Um, so it, it's not about stopping a war because the Republicans think that the Russians are okay and they can do business with them. It's about stopping the funding of a war because the American taxpayer is furious that money is being sent to Ukraine but not spent on their needs at home. And Scott, for the final, can you talk about your book? I see your book behind you, and it's about a template for for peacemaking. Could you talk about your book for our audience? You mean this book here? Yes. Disarmament, exactly. the Perestroika, yeah. Arms Control, and the End of the Soviet Union. Um, sure. Um, I think, you know, I was one of the inspectors that was involved in this treaty. This is a treaty that was signed in 1987, implemented in 1988, to get rid of an entire class of nuclear weapons that was threatening Europe with imminent destruction. Uh, intermediate range missiles, the SS-20 missile on the Russian side, the Pershing-2 and the ground launch cru a cruise missile on the American side. There were other missiles involved. Those are the big players. Um, my job was to go to the factory that produced the SS-20 missile and monitor it to make sure they weren't producing them because the SS-20 missile was banned. And the story of how myself and a small number of American inspectors working together with their Soviet counterparts were able to build from nothing this very complex monitoring system uh, with all the political problems that were going on back and forth is um, you know, one of the untold successes of the Cold War. Uh, people have heard about the INF Treaty, um, and they know that there are weapons inspectors involved, but they don't know anything beyond that. This gets into the nuts and bolts and shows just how hard this job was and how close to failure we came on several occasions, how much opposition there was to this treaty, both in the United States and the Soviet Union, um, and how that opposition almost tripped up the inspectors and caused the treaty to fail. Uh, we overcame all of this. It also is a very interesting part, a piece of, uh, of Soviet history, um, because I talk about you know, arms control and the, and, and the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, there's a direct relationship between arms control, perestroika, and the conditions that brought down the Soviet Union. And we inspectors were right there in the middle of it, in one of the most important places 
um, in the Soviet Union when it came to the confluence of arms control and perestroika. Uh, the Vodkins uh, Missile Factory, the Vodkins Production Association, um, you know, made its money by building missiles. And it's a factory town, just like all the other defense town, cities around uh, Russia. You know, the money comes in from, you know, to build these weapons, and that money gets parsed out to make schools, to pave roads, to build buildings, to make the standard of living what it was in the town. And when you eliminate missiles like the SS-20, the SS-12, uh, which is a Vodkins missile, the SS-23, which is a Vodkins missile, three missiles were eliminated, which means they weren't building missiles anymore, and they weren't making money. All they had left was two missiles that they continued to produce, and there was being pressure put on them by the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty to get rid of those missiles. And then you have Gorbachev, so you have a reduction of money right off the bat. Then you have Gorbachev trying to change the economic structure together with the political structure. One of the interesting things is I was there at the first election running the Soviet Union. I mean, I watched it. We watched the candidates uh, debate. We read their, their proposals, and then I attended the... Uh, the actual polling place and, and was able to see democracy in action. And it was an amazing thing. I, we watched the Soviet press transition into being a mouthpiece of the Communist Party into truly a investigative journalism where they're asking hard questions, demanding answers, and publishing all right there in a newspaper that we, we wouldn't have known any of this if we weren't living there. We were able to read everything, meet the people, see it. So we saw what, what was going on with perestroika, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, and we knew the confluence between that and what we were doing, uh, and it made this fantastic story um, that couldn't be told, because as long as the INF Treaty was in place, inspectors are prohibited from discussing what occurred, what happened. But in 2019, uh, Donald Trump pulled the United States out of the INF Treaty, and then the Russians followed after that, and suddenly I could tell the story. So I spent three years writing this book. Um, I made use of uh, an archive that has never been used by anybody ever before, the, the archive of the inspectors. Um, I, and I tell a very uh, intimate story, um, but a thorough history um, that I, I try to make as entertaining and informative as possible. Now, people say, okay, but that's history, Scott, history. I mean, really, do you, I'm going to fall asleep listening to history. And I say, yes, but if you're listening to this broadcast, that means you're concerned about Ukraine. That means you're concerned about the conflict between Russia and, and Ukraine, the, or, or, or Russia and the United States. And you're probably thinking, how do we get out of this mess? How do we get off this? See, the history of the INF Treaty is not just a history, but it's a template. It's a roadmap. Because the 1980s were worse than the current situation. Trust me. I was alive back then. I know. And uh, we almost went to nuclear war several times. Uh, the, co the potential for confrontation was much greater. We called them the evil empire. They called us enemy number one. Very dangerous situation. And yet we were able, through the INF Treaty, through the vehicle of arms control, to create a mechanism where, with cooperation, we work together to achieve peace and stability. We did it once. We can do it again. And people say, how? I say, read my book. See what we did. See, see how difficult it was, but it is possible. It is a beacon of hope, a template uh, that, that people don't have to be in despair because it shows that if the United States and Russia are willing and able to work together to accomplish meaningful disarmament, that that can lead to uh, the de-escalation of the current tension and hopefully the ability of our two nations to live, you know, to peacefully coexist. So it's not just a great history, but it's a template of victory in terms of how to peacefully resolve the current crisis. Thank you for this, Scott. I know I appreciate your work, the work you're doing for all the humanity. You, I, I see every time you are you are doing the interview with all the people like me, just ordinary people all around the world to spread the, the truth, nothing but the truth. And uh, we we have to thank we we have to thank you all of us. Humiliated Israel, and now Israel in this humiliation is um, is seeking revenge. And one of the problems with the revenge is that one, 
Israel doesn't have the ability to, I mean, there's that famous scene in the movie Top Gun where Maverick is being chewed out by the uh, commander of the air group, CAG. And he says, son, your body's right in check, or your mouth's right in check, your body can't CAG, something of that nature. Right. Uh, well, this is happening in Israel. You have a lot of disgraced, and I need to remind everybody, every single Israeli politician and general who speaks publicly today about this issue is a disgraced individual. We wouldn't be in this situation had they done their job. These are failed politicians, failed military leaders. So when they stand before you and speak in a very aggressive manner, just remember, they got beat on October 7th. Their job was to prevent that from happening, and they didn't do that. So now when you hear them thumping their chest and saying, we're going to exact revenge, take it with a grain of salt, because these people have proven their incompetence. Israel has mobilized over 300,000 reservists. Let's be clear who these reservists are. They are not combat-hardened troops. These are troops with a very minimal level of military training, and even the training they got was never used to full effect. Then they left the military. There's been no follow on training. Now they're called back up and they're being asked to go into the most difficult kind of warfare imaginable, urban warfare. And not just in a city, but a city that's been destroyed. Anybody who knows anything about urban warfare, you can track it from Stalingrad, you know, through Monte Cassino to Bakhmut and Mariupol. When our experience in, in Mosul, when you blow up a city, you've made the job of defending the city that much easier, and you've made the job of attacking that much more difficult. And also keep in mind this, Hamas carried out a flawless, flawless attack on October 7th. It was professionally planned and executed. They didn't do that without having an end game, meaning that what the, everything they did from destroying the Israeli military capacity to kidnapping people and bringing them back into Gaza was designed to enrage Israel so that Israel stops thinking rationally and be lure Israel into Gaza, knowing that the Israeli Air Force would bomb. Every bomb that hits Gaza is not killing Hamas. It's killing innocent Palestinians. Hamas is well below ground, not being impacted by these bombs because they thought about it beforehand. They know the weapon. They know, it's, you know what its effects are on the ground, and they've brought that in. The Israeli army right now is scared to death. These reservists have, don't have the training. They're scared to death. If they go in, they will be slaughtered. If they go in also, it's likely they will trigger a larger regional conflict. Hezbollah in the north has said they don't want to get involved in this, but if Israel keeps slaughtering the Palestinian people, which they have over 6,500 dead, over a thousand of them are children, have been killed by the Israeli indiscriminate bombing, uh, Hezbollah said they will intervene. And let's keep in mind, Hezbollah until Hamas's victory on October 7th, Hezbollah was the only Arab force that actually beat the Israelis in a stand-up fight. So, Scott, I have a question. I mean, I think the attack from Hamas is a brutal attack, uh, you know, against innocent Israelis. And, and I think what we've seen is a huge outcry from, you know, certainly the Western world, the United States and our allies, everyone standing very clearly with Israel. I mean, would you agree with this is that that the rise of Hamas, I mean, they were democratically elected in 2006. Do you think that the reason for them being elected is, is simply the fact that these Palestinians felt no other option was left for them? The fact that they just didn't have a future and so that they would resort to something of this extremism? I mean, I'm, I'm certainly under the belief that Hamas is, is, is definitely closer to a terrorist organization than a legitimate you know, freedom fighter. But I mean, certainly carrying out those attacks. But I can also understand that probably the conditions that Israel created for Palestine is the exact breeding grounds for an organization like Hamas to be democratically elected and to, you know, go carry out those attacks. So I am not going to accept the idea that Hamas on October 7th was a terrorist organization. They were carrying out a military assault and they carried out with far more precision and far less collateral damage than what Israel's doing. If you're going to call Hamas a terrorist organization, then every single Israeli pilot that flies over Gaza today and indiscriminately drops bombs that have killed 6,500 Palestinian civilians, over a thousand of whom are children, then they are terrorists. And if they're terrorists, everybody wears the green of the IDF is a terrorist and every Israeli politician is a terrorist. And I think it's more accurate to call Israel the terrorist entity in this case than it is to, to, to say Hamas. The history of Hamas and the formation of Hamas is, is complex. They come from a Muslim extremist foundation. The Muslim Brotherhood is, is their ideological base. Uh, unlike the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which is more secular in nature, Hamas is definitely very much fundamentalist in terms of their religious beliefs. The Israelis have been fostering Hamas from the very beginning. I mean, Hamas, you know, was conceived 
perceived by the Palestinians as its own thing. But it was the Israeli government that said, hey, this we can use. You right. see, Israel didn't want the Palestinian Liberation Army or PLO to become this powerful entity because the last thing Israel wants is a viable Palestinian state. I'll say that one more time, just so people understand what I'm saying. Israel does not want a Palestinian state, never has, right. won't tolerate it. They've talked about it, but they knew they were never going to allow it to happen. And one of the ways they prevented it from happening was to create a division within Palestinian population. So they promoted Hamas. They funneled money into Hamas. They openly collaborated with Hamas, even though I don't think Hamas understood they were being collaborated with, uh, to, and they empowered Hamas. All the terrorist acts that took place in the 1990s took place because Israel wanted them to take place. I'm not saying they planned them. I'm, I'm, what I am saying is that Israel viewed what, that as a very effective way of not only dividing the Palestinian population, but then demonizing them in the eyes of the world so that there wouldn't be a Palestinian state. You see, if Hamas is around blowing up buses and bridges, no one's going to support a Palestinian state because everybody has bought into the notion that Israeli security must come first. Israel was facilitating the acts of terror that took place against them by creating the organization that produced the terrorists. That doesn't mean that Israel wasn't hunting them down and killing them. Of course they were. I'm just saying that Israel is not an innocent party here. Benjamin yeah. Netanyahu is not an innocent party. In 2005, they made a decision to transition from a terrorist or Israel, Israel made the decision to transition Hamas from a terrorist organization into a political organization. They coordinate with the Qatari government to pour in millions of dollars to turn Hamas into a political party, and then they helped facilitate them in elections that Hamas won, by the way. Hamas won the majority of seats in the Palestinian parliament. And then but then what happened is Israel, I think, was a little taken aback. They wanted a little party. They didn't want a big party. So they then facilitated a civil war between Fatah, the military wing of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, and Hamas. Hamas had a significant representation in the West Bank, a very strong representation in Gaza. When the civil war ended, Fatah had been totally eliminated in Gaza and Hamas had been kicked out of the West Bank. So Gaza became a Hamas stronghold. And from 2007 onwards, Hamas has run the, the show. There are other resistance groups. The Palestinian Islamic Jihad is one that's well known, but the the biggest and the most influential is Hamas, and they're running the show there. Now, they have a job of governance, and they are doing that, but they've never forgotten their resistance roots. I, again, ask everybody just to reflect on the reality that Gaza is an open-air concentration camp. If you lived in an open-air concentration camp, tell me what you would do. And if you say, I would sit there and do nothing, you're a liar. Every single man worthy of the name would wake up every morning saying, how do I hurt them? hurt the occupiers, hurt the people that have pinned me in. And they would be very receptive to the message of resistance that comes from Hamas. So, right. you know, now we come back to things that Joe Biden has said. The only solution to this problem, the only solution is the creation of a Palestinian state. If you want to defeat Hamas, and the only way you're going to defeat Hamas, you have to create a Palestinian state that diffuses Hamas's reason to exist. Hamas exists to resist Israel. Right. But if right. there is a Palestinian state, there's really nothing left to resist. And right. so Hamas right. will go away. Right. I think I, I was reading a very good New York Times article where uh, one of the comments on that article was that Hamas really represents an ideology more than it does a group of people. Right. And I guess yeah. you're, you're basically concluding that same and thing. And how do you kill an ideology? Right. You replace it with what they want or with something that's better right. than that. But how do you not kill an ideology? Well, then you continue uh, dropping bombs, yeah, killing people. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I, I do. I think that is well documented as well that, that Israel certainly this has certainly backfired on Israel's plan then. Right. Because like you had just mentioned, it has been well documented that Israel actually has supported Hamas over the years, mainly to create that division. So for those of you that aren't clear, you know, Hamas does have the stronghold in Gaza, but there are many Palestinians in Gaza and you know more on the West Bank that oppose Hamas. So it is you know creating this internal division. Right. It's not a united Palestinian front. So it was really a move from Israel and certainly Netanyahu to support Hamas in the sense of now you've broken up the, the support in Palestine. It's not a united front. Therefore, they won't be moving towards statehood. And that that has seemed to now backfire, obviously, because of these uh, attacks that were carried out on October 7th. Scott, I've got an interesting thing I want to shift to because there is a new article that was just written in the Financial Times. I'm going to bring it up here, is that fears grow that Israel has no plan agreed for a post war Gaza. And when we read this article, it says the lack of an exit plan is one factor in the delays to the Gaza ground operation that has been long threatened by Benjamin Netanyahu's government. There is no plan for the day after. 
And this is the quote from the article that really stands out as the Americans went crazy when they realized uh, there was no plan. So I want to talk to you about this specifically because, you know, initially, I think it was on October 9th or 10th, maybe, you know, a couple of days after Netanyahu sent out a very clear message. He said, you know, northern Gaza, 1.1 million people, you have 24 hours to evacuate, move into southern Gaza, we're coming in. Obviously, at the time, that was a, an impossible request, right? There's no way they could move a million people in less than 24 hours. And there was a huge concern, right, that all of a sudden, you know, potentially a million people are going to get caught in these crossfires. It's now been almost two weeks. We haven't seen Israel, uh, you know, make this move yet. And I think now we're starting to see a little bit of pushback from the Americans saying, you know, what is the eventual plan here? You know, I mean, are, we, are, are you going to move forward with this? So I want to kind of get your thoughts on this as far as, you know, does the ground invasion happen if they are to be moved from northern Gaza for this ground invasion? This is the innocent civilians we're talking about. You know, where do they go? You know, where, where I mean, there's only one place that kind of makes sense, I guess, with, at least from the Israeli side, is they're saying they could potentially go to the Sinai Peninsula, which is basically just a vast open desert. So I want to get your thoughts on on this next phase here and what, what's now happening as Israel potential ground invasion is just a few days away and you know what's really going to happen next. Well, first of all, I just want to set the stage. Everything we're talking about is a war crime. Let's just be straight up honest about this. The concept of demanding that a million people leave their homes and move is a war crime. It's collective punishment. It's against the law. So anybody who sits there and says, you know, well, you know, we should consider, you're no better than the Nazis. You're no better than any war criminal that's ever existed. The fact that Israel is allowed to articulate this policy and not be held to account is stunning. The concept of collective punishment, which Israel has codified as official doctrine since 2006, is called the Dahawa Doctrine, mowing the grass, is a war crime, a literal war crime. It's collective punishment. But nobody's saying anything. Everybody's just sitting there going, well, it's Israel. It's the Palestinians. It's normal. Uh, I guess it's normal for Israel to commit war crimes against Palestine because they do on a daily basis. Everything Israel is doing in this conflict is a war crime. So right off the bat, we can't legitimize a war crime by saying, well, I mean, those 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 million people got to move. No, they don't. Those million people can't move and they're not going to move. No one's going to open up the gates. They're not going to the Sinai. The tragic reality is those million people will die before they move. And now the question is, how much death will the world tolerate before they step in and tell Israel, enough is enough, you're done. Israel will not launch a, a ground incursion, a large-scale ground incursion into Gaza. They can't do it. There's American military teams right now telling them, you can't. I mean, again, the question is, just, it's not just a, a political end game; it's a military end game. You go into Gaza, and then what? They don't have a plan. Remember, Israel was taken by surprise on October 7th. So everything that's happening right now is basically a plan they're making up on the spot. Right. They're making it up. They've done two major military exercises recently. One, chariots of fire last year, this year, firm hand. All of them were what we call stress tests. They were stress testing the entire Israeli military establishment, premised on the notion that everything went bad at once, meaning Gaza, Hamas, West Bank, Palestinian Liberation Organization, Hezbollah, Syria, and Iran. First of all, each time Israel was swamped. They couldn't handle it. But the other thing about the stress test is they never considered this. Under no circumstances in the stress test did they ever say, okay, part of the Israeli response will be to mobilize 300,000 Israeli reserves and send them to Gaza. Right. The reserves were mobilized and sent to Lebanon, to Lebanon to fight Hezbollah. Gaza and the West Bank were considered to be police actions against uh, militants, against terrorists, but not an outright war. So whatever war plan Israel had has been shredded, thrown away, and they're making it up as they go along, which means they don't have a clue what they're doing. And that's what's driving the Americans crazy because Israel's saying, we're going to go into Gaza and America's saying, Wait, what's your plan? Right. What, what, what are you going to do, Israel, now that you locked in 300,000 troops to Gaza when Hezbollah comes across the border up north? Right. Because in your real war plan, which we coordinated with you, you had most of your forces up there. And I tend to believe in the war game, you lost because Hezbollah has all these missiles, they swamped your air defense, uh, they blew up your cities, they blew up your military bases, and they seized northern Israel. So now you won't have any forces up there. 
And if you take a look at what's happening right now, the Israeli armor units up there, they're almost in revolt because Hezbollah is picking their tanks off one by one by one. I think it's 22 Merkava tanks have been blown up so far. And when I say blown up, that means dead crew members. You know, Hezbollah is suffering casualties too. Israel is responding back. But my point is, this is not an invincible Israeli army. Right. This is an army that Hezbollah has been studying the fight for you know, continuously since 2006 when they last beat Israel. You know, Israel's army today is an army of soft people who join. They don't train hard. I mean, you're getting reservists, uh, generals coming in saying they don't know how to clean their weapons. They're not motivated. These guys would give them equipment. They they don't wear it right. They're not in physical condition. I was talking to a Russian colonel that was talking about urban warfare, the Russian lessons from uh, Mariupol and Bakhmut. He said, you know, the first thing is you have to be extraordinarily fit to do this. Right. Because you're wearing around 50, 60 pounds worth of combat kit. Right. And if you're not wearing it, you're going to die right. because you're right. going to get hit in the head. You're going to get hit in the chest. You're going to get hit in the groin, in the back. And if you're not wearing this gear, you're dead. This way, you might get knocked down. You might get wounded, but at least you'll be alive. But you got to wear the gear. He said in running across, because you don't walk, running from point A to point B, constantly getting up, getting down. He says, it's if you're not training for this, you're in trouble. He said, we had to take our units and go out. In addition to training on tactics, we had to get them physically fit. They had to be used to wearing this stuff. The reservists right now, these are fat donut eating boys and girls. They're not well fit. They're going to exhaust themselves. They're going to go across into Gaza and they're going to drop like flies, not from Hamas fire, but just from heat exhaustion and the fact that they can't carry the weight. They're not conditioned to do it. They don't have the proper tactics. Again, the guy was saying, you know, we had to learn that you don't use SWAT tact, you know, because everybody plays Call of Duty and every play, you know, watches the movies. And of course, all the commandos get together at the door and then they shotgun in and they they shoot the thing up. And he says, you do that, a drone comes in, drops a mortar on you, kills everybody. Right. In modern war, you're dispersed. And you have to train to do that. It's a whole new mindset of dispersal, et cetera. Israel hasn't trained to do this. So, so Scott, you know, do, you, do you think that, do you, so are you, do you predict that Israel will not go in with this ground invasion? Do you think that Israel can't go in with this ground invasion? There's two reasons why. One, they're going to lose. And the Americans are telling them straight up, you're going to lose. What Israel will do is have small incursions. You'll see raids going in. Okay. But the idea of 100,000 Israeli troops lining up their tanks and going in, that isn't going to happen. Yeah. And one of the main reasons why it's not going to happen is America's saying, what do you do when Hezbollah comes across the border? Right. What's your plan? Right, because you're just you're, you're spread too thin, right? You've got all the not troops. Not only that, but in. Hamas just, just wiped out Iron Dome. Iron Dome, they've shot all their ammunition. There's no ammunition left. They're begging America for more. We gave them the last 360-odd rounds we have. We've got nothing left. We're trying to produce it, but you can't produce it overnight. And, you know, there's 200,000 rockets in Hezbollah's arsenal, 200,000. Right. Let's say Israel has... Oh, 3,000 interceptors left. Hezbollah simply fires 3,000 rockets. Israel expends everything. Now they have 197,000 more that'll come in and hit Israel without any defense. Nothing. So, Scott, you've, you've brought up a good point here, and, and you know, is, is that a bigger threat to the North, Hezbollah. And I want to shift our strategy here and our conversation more towards Iran now, because I think there is a lot of speculation that, you know, the potential is for a bigger conflict here in the region to really erupt. And I think this is why the United States obviously immediately sent over, you know, military aircraft carriers. I mean, we've got a huge, you know, military envoy going over there right now, already there. And I think this is a very sensitive situation, obviously, you know, when we're to look at the Russia Ukraine situation, you know, Ukraine, we can say is an ally, but certainly nowhere like Israel. I mean, you know, we would never put boots on the on the ground in Ukraine for any matter. But I think if push comes to shove, you know, we would certainly see American troops on the ground or we would see, you know, America rushing to do whatever it needs to do to stabilize that region. What, what do you feel is the biggest threat right now? I mean, do you feel that there is a big potential for a conflict between the US and Iran? And, and what is your thoughts on the, the grander picture if this does not stay contained and it really erupts into a larger regional conflict. What does that look like to you? Well, let me just start by pointing out that I think the greatest threat to Israel is actually from Hamas, not from Hezbollah, because it's Hamas that's, that has brought the issue of a Palestinian state to the forefront. And that's the biggest threat to Israel's vision of a greater Israel. You know, it, it undoes decades of Israeli policy. So that's the greatest threat. Let me, let me, let's talk about Hezbollah real brief. 
Hezbollah doesn't want to fight Israel. They don't want to. Hezbollah is focused on governing in Lebanon. They're a political party in addition to having this uh, this very strong militia. But their their goal right now, Lebanon is a nation that's devastated by you know a, a collapsing economy. And Hezbollah is part of the government trying to build a functioning coalition. The last thing they need is a war with Israel where Israeli bombs level West Beirut as they did in 2006. So Hezbollah is not itching for a fight. This is why... You know, Hezbollah has said, if as long as what Israel does doesn't cross the line of tolerance, we'll stay out of this fight. And Hamas has told everybody, we got this under control, guys. We don't need you. We got this under control. And they do. They're in total control of the situation. It's callously, they don't care about the people upstairs, or they do, but they're like Charles de Gaulle, they're willing to sacrifice them for the greater good. If you asked the majority of Palestinians, if you could die, give your life for the birth of a Palestinian nation, they would say yes, because for 75 years, that's all they dreamed of. And now, thanks to Hamas, they have that possibility. Hezbollah does not want to be a part of this fight. Iran does not want to be a part of this fight. Again, Iran has met with the Hamas political leadership in Qatar, and we're told the same thing. We don't want you to intervene. We we, we got this under control. What's that tell you? When the Israelis say, we know that um, Iran gave the green light. Iran knew nothing about this. This took Iran totally by surprise, just like Hezbollah was taken by surprise. And Iran is just saying, hey, guys, um, we just normalized relations with Saudi Arabia. Big deal. I mean, it's a huge deal. We which, are by the, the way, was negotiated by China. By China. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we are now joining BRICS. Right. We were a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Our focus is economic. We are focusing on getting the economy of Iran, which has been suffering under sanctions for decades, on its feet moving forward. The last thing Iran needs is a war. And they don't want a war. They want to avoid a war. And they have communicated this to the United States, which is another reason why the United States is telling Israel, you're not going into Gaza, guys, because nobody wants this war. You're going to lose the war. You can't win. And if you go in, you you risk turning this into a regional war that nobody wants. Now, we know if you've read Barbara Tuckman's book, uh, The Guns of August, we know that in World War One, in the summer of 1914, nobody wanted a world war, but everybody slow walked their way to it because it was just one of these things, you know, like a slow moving traffic accident that you know is going to be horrible and you're watching it and you're not doing anything to stop because it's inevitable. We could be on that path. Hopefully we're not. Hopefully the United States has communicated appropriately, not only with Israel, but with Hezbollah and with Iran, that we want to avoid escalation. This is why, if you noticed last night, there was a massive attack against American bases in Syria and Iraq by uh, so-called Shia resistance forces. 24 Americans, according to the news, were, were wounded, soldiers. One contractor died of a heart attack. Now, normally, this would be the kind of thing that that would uh, precipitate massive American counterstrike. But have you seen American bombers in the air dropping bombs? No. Why? Because this is called escalation management. This is where we are going to absorb a certain amount of punishment as as sort of like a safety valve. You want to bleed off this pressure, bleed it off. But what you have to ensure when you bleed off the pressure, that you're not doing anything to generate more pressure. Again, uh, let me just make this point. For the first time in a long time, there is a chance for real peace in the Middle East. Because you could never talk about genuine peace in the Middle East if it didn't include a legitimate Palestinian state. Thanks to Hamas, thanks to what Hamas did, that option is now on the table. And there's recognition by everybody that there will be no going forward, no return to the status quo uh, without a Palestinian state being created. This is bad news for Israel, but it's good news for Israel. Israel wanted, you know, wants security. There will never be security without a Palestinian state because there will always be conflict. Right. There will always be a war. Israel somehow believes that they can make this problem go away. They they haven't. The only way this problem goes away is what we talked about earlier. You create a legitimate Palestinian state. Uh, you allow the Palestinian people now to have hope based upon their own hard work to create their own nation. And, and you instantly delegitimize the kind of violence violence that Hamas is promoting. You will compel Hamas to become a political entity dedicated to the growth and prosperity of a Palestinian state, or else they will be thrust into the trash bin of history by the Palestinian people because they have no legitimate reason to continue. So there's now, for the first time in a long time, legitimate hope for peace 
in the Middle East. Do you think that, uh, now I would imagine that Israel, the last thing on their mind right now is establishing that legitimate state of Palestine. I mean, do you think that this is going to have to take something from like a President Biden really meeting with Netanyahu and trying to convince him? I mean, it feels that the United States is really the only country in the world that could have any type of leverage or any can really talk to Israel right now. I think we're the only country that really has any chance to sit down and communicate. I know that the, the situation is difficult because Netanyahu is a very far right extreme politician and he has surrounded himself with a cabinet that is even more extreme than he is. There's also he's wanted on corruption charges. His hands are kind of tied as well because he can't do a lot of things. And I think his cabinet basically is, is saying, you know, we want this revenge. And now has I would almost kind of argue this point a little bit that is, is this not throwing uh, the, the chance for statehood even further down the line? I mean, wouldn't Israel be fighting you know, desperately to avoid that? Or is this really their only option? Is, is it, like you said, if they want security, they're going to have to establish the statehood. Israel doesn't have a vote anymore. They got beat. Let me just make it clear. Yeah. When you win, you get a vote. When you're the victor, you get to dictate. But when you've been defeated, you have to listen. You have to accept. Benjamin Netanyahu is a man who, even before this uh, October 7th attack was on thin ice politically. You know, in order to stay in power, because as you pointed out, he's been charged with very serious corruption charges. And again, you're innocent until proven guilty. But I mean, sometimes it's very obvious that you're guilty and he's guilty of corruption charges that will put him in jail for a very long time, not just him, but his wife. But what he's done with his Likud allies is they've taken, he was reelected. He's created a, a, a governing coalition, but he had to go far right to do it. In Israel, they don't have a constitution, but they have the basic law, which replicates that notion. And what Netanyahu has done together with his far right allies in the Knesset is they've rewritten the basic law of Israel so that the judiciary is now subordinate to the Knesset and the prime minister. So any judge that moves forward with a case against uh, Netanyahu for corruption can be impeached. They'll just impeach him. Bam, gone. I mean, this is the kind of stuff of banana republics. This is why hundreds of thousands of Israelis took to the streets before October 7th. They were saying, we're done. The president of Israel was saying, we are very close to a civil war. Right. Not, and, and, and he was saying, literally, we, we're very close to this nation breaking apart and going to war with itself. That was the situation that existed prior to October 7th. The one thing Netanyahu had going for him was that he had convinced people that he was the security guy, that he alone could secure Israel from Iran, from Hezbollah, from Hamas. He was the man. Right. Well, he failed. October well, 7th is a failure. Right. And oh, so now, cool. yeah. yeah, so now when we talk about Israel's political future, understand this. At some point in time, the generals who failed, the politicians who failed, will have to shut up. Because right now they're sucking all the oxygen out, saying terrorists. They're making stuff up. I mean, look, we can go back to the beginning of World War I and look at atrocity propaganda. You know, when the Germans marched into Belgium, they were literally accused of ripping babies out of the wombs, of beheading children, of doing raping, all this stuff. Hamas has been accused of the same thing every day. It's a standard thing. They beheaded children. They raped women. They did this. There's no evidence that they did any of that. It hasn't been presented. You might find... A, a one example here, one example, but from a, a, a policy standpoint, in fact, there's overwhelming evidence that Hamas being a very fundamentalist uh, Islamic organization, they actually treat women with respect. Imagine that. All the women hostages have said they treated us with respect. They put us, they gave us medical care. Now, the, the people say, well, that's just propaganda, Scott. I don't know. But until you find a narrative that counters that, that's the one that we have documented, not by Hamas saying it, but by the hostages themselves, about the people that were held by Hamas. So the point I'm, I'm trying to get at is that uh, at some point in time, the Netanyahu government is going to be held to account for what happened on October 7th, and the Israeli people will not forgive them. Everybody who died, when it, become, when it becomes documented, when they do the investigation, because every one of those bodies had an autopsy done on it, there is a file in there that says bullet wound here, entry point here, exit point here, mechanism of death is this, time of death is this, place of death is that. And when an investigator comes in and starts overlaying all that out, it's going to become clear that what the survivors of some of these kibbutzes have been saying, that it was the IDF that killed everybody, that the IDF came in and just haphazardly, without any discipline, in a total panic, fired indiscriminately, killing the hostages and Hamas alike. Then this atrocity propaganda gets flushed down the toilet. And suddenly, 
We're talking about criminality. It's criminality that's taking place. And the reason why I bring all this up is I don't think the Netanyahu government is going to be the government that's involved in the end game here. I think they'll be gone. I think there's going to be a new government in Israel, one that's reflective of the reality. It's going to be a government that has little or no negotiating position with the United States because the United States is looking at a bigger picture. And the bigger picture it requires stability in the Middle East. In order to do that, we need Saudi Arabia on our side. We need Iran to be pacified. We need the Arab world to be doing what we want it to do. That is our big picture. And we're not going to let Israel get in the way. It has eliminated the one major obstacle to peace in the Middle East, and that is Israeli intransigence about a Palestinian state. That's gone. There will be a Palestinian state. Israel has no choice but to accept this. It will be dictated to them by the United States, by the international community, because the international community is turning on Israel as we speak. As I said, you can only drop so many bombs on a helpless civilian population before people call you out for being the war criminals that you are. So I I think going forward, we're going to be seeing a different Israel. And this is the game changer, because the Middle East without that, that isn't dominated by an Israeli oppressor or just a, a very powerful assertive Israel is a Middle East that hasn't existed since, you know, 19, in the, the 1970s. It's going to be a wonderful thing. I believe in an Israeli state. Don't get me wrong. I believe that Israel has a right to exist, that there needs to be a Jewish homeland. I mean, uh, the Holocaust proves that. But you can't have a homeland and expect to live in peace and security when, in order to get that homeland, you deny millions of people the right to have their own homeland, which is what Israel is doing with the Palestinians. That's not how you... 